Welcome, welcome, Al and Sue. There you are on. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Alicia, for that wonderful and warm introduction. So I'm the Al side of, <laughs> of Al and Sue. And I'm the Sue side. I guess that's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, we're here to tell you about travel and rotary, of course, but also about a different lifestyle. Okay, and, and we'll tease that out as, as we go through here. So it's been very impactful for us and we're looking to see if it works for others. So that's why we're here today to talk about it and to get to know more of our fellow Rotarians and ITHF members along the way. So you should, uh, someone give me a thumbs up. Can you see the cover slide there? Okay. Okay, we're good. Then I will drag it over to my other screen. Okay. So we call this nesting abroad. Why do we call it nesting abroad? Because birds nest in a place for a season. And that's what we do. We traveled around and, and spent like a couple days in different places and thought, well, this is really cool, but I wonder what it's like to actually live here. And so that's what we try to do. We choose two places a year and we are there for the spring season and the fall season in two different places in the world. And we nest, we live there like we're residents in this city. Um, then in the spring and in the fall, uh, I mean, in the summer and the winter, we go back to our house in um, Virginia. Um, we treat our nest as a short-term home. We cook there, we shop there. Um, we do everything that we would do if we lived there. Um, and it's, it's, we also get to see the sites and learn about the culture and learn about the history and try to connect mm -hmm. with neighbors and other people that we meet there. So, so there's us eating in our apartment and here's Sue shopping with a friend of hers that we made in Turkey. And yep, working out at a gym. The things you do when you're home, right? Try to live like the folks are living. That's you. That is, and it's you and Val. So what's really important is that we're not unplugging from what's important to us, families and friends. So in this picture on the left, for example, of course you can see Sue and me, but here's our neighbor who lives across the street. She's a Dean of a local community college at the time. Um, over here, you can see Sue's father. And this was 2015, I'll bring this in the story later, but he was a Rotarian and we're at York and he's doing the pendant exchange. And this is a part of my extended family. Yep, there I am and there's Sue, but in the middle is my sister and it was her surprise birthday. We were nesting in Santa Fe during late COVID instead of going back across the United States. And so you see a whole lot of nieces across here as well. So we're able to do those things and we strive to do them to stay in contact. The photo with Al and I and Val, that was Krakow. Right. But it's, it's not... It's, it's not all vacation. Basically, if you can structure your work to work anywhere, and after COVID, that's a lot more acceptable, right? People understand that better. If you can do that, then the question becomes, why not? Why can't you achieve other life goals while you're working as well? So these are pictures of us working. You know, here's an office. Me, here I'm giving a presentation in Krakow on technology and startups. And here's Sue working in the office with her smart board over there. And this is just a list of some of the things that Alicia talked about in our introduction that we do for, for money and then that we do to give back to the community as well. Okay. okay. Back to you. But it's really life enriching. I mean, to live in different places all over the world and learn about the history and the culture and, and meet up with people. Um, it, it's been a fascinating ride. It's been great for us. It's been great actually for our marriage, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's, I really think it's, it's made our life much, much richer. Mm -hmm. So we lived, when we lived in York, we hiked Hadrian's Wall, just took an excursion doing that. There it is in the tower. And by living in Florence, we happen to be there in the spring and Easter. And you can see in the background, pulled by bulls, or is it oxen? Oxen. Oxen, yeah. the burning cart. So they kind of mix yes. yeah. exploding cart, but it, it burns. They, uh, they mix Christianity along with some of the older pagan things, for example. And you only get that 
when you're living there. You just kind of get richer that way. Mm -hmm. The other thing, though, is it also the lifestyle, right, of being able to work remotely made other things possible. So on the left, on my bucket list was to ride my bicycle across the United States. So two friends joined me. This is a retired Army senior leader. And Paul, Paul Scott, is a Brit. Yep, we met him when we were nesting in York. So and he, he said, I'd love to come. I've never been to America before. He loves to cycle. And he had no idea he was getting into, but he had a <laughs> wonderful time. We raised money for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Education, yeah. Right, education and math. So, so we rode three days and worked one day and then also worked in the afternoons. So also, this is a picture of me with my parents down in Florida. It gave us a month to go down there and work from there and take care of a lot of elder care and, and make sure that we were well connected with my parents as they entered this phase of life. And it's because we had the infrastructure set up to be gone from our home that we were able to do that. Mm -hmm. So so it's more than just living in cool places. It's, it's enabling in other ways as well. So the question everybody asks is, so where have you been? Can you all see that? Can you all see um, the different places there? Um, yeah. Um, so that's so we are about ready to head on our 13th trip um, to Sydney, Australia. We're leaving on Wednesday. Um, but you can see all the different places we've been there. Um, Krakow, Poland, and uh, Dubrovnik, Croatia, and um, Taipei, Taiwan, and, you know, just look down the list there. Um, any of those places at this point, we feel like we know quite a bit about. <laughs> so the two, two times um, we did in state, in country, other than running across the country, we, um, at COVID, we, we, we stayed in the country. So. So what, she, what she's saying is, yeah, we stayed in the United States for those times to be safer. And for those that are coming to the international conference, number 13, yep, we're going to take a, a quick flight down to Melbourne at the end of May and see you there. Okay, so let's look at an example, nesting in Turkey, right? Let's pick what is it like to be nesting? Well, first, where is Istanbul in Turkey? Given the sad earthquake, right, about a month ago, it's been in the press and more people are familiar with the geography of Turkey, located here you know, on the eastern side of Europe and the western side of Asia. They actually cross both continents. And you can see they connect the Black Sea that's been so much in the news with Ukraine and Crimea to the Aegean, Aegean that goes down to the, uh, eventually down to the Mediterranean. And there's this little tiny river, the Bosphorus, right? That connects it. And the city is actually on both sides of the Bosphorus. In fact, you come over here to the right, there's that Bosphorus and there's the European side on the left and the Asian side on the right. And right here in this box with this star, that's that's where our apartment was. We rented a, an apartment for three months right there. Mm -hmm. In a little town called Shahangar. Well, a part of the city called mm -hmm. Shahangar. So, um, and it was great location. We were able to walk down to the, um, to the, to the Southern um, part across the bridge and um, just, being there for three months, we were able to see so much more than the folks that just blast through for a couple of days. And um, some of the Roman, um, because the Romans, it was the end of the Roman Empire there. It was a, the, the Eastern Roman Empire. And so there's the aqueducts that are there. The, uh, that's uh, Al sitting on a, the wall that Mehmet the Conqueror blasted down to then defeat the Romans when the Ottomans took over, um, the Hagia Sophia, um, and just just, just gorgeous. Um, it was it was an amazing, extremely rich historical um, place to be. We, uh, there, we there's still more stuff to see. <laughs> Three months really wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. So, but the the main point here is a chance to get out and see things. Some of these things are on the tourist bucket list, but many aren't, particularly some of the tiles, mosaics, and walking the walls, and things like that. And that's our neighborhood, uh, Chihangar, which was wonderful. Al's standing there on our roof, um, and you can, and then the other picture with the cruise ships is um, from the roof, too, that was right by where the cruise ships docked, 
um, Sesame Street was in our in our neighborhood, <laughs> so I can tell you how to get to Sesame Street. Um, and uh, it was also the antiquing area of the city. So there was, it was just full of great little shops and antique shops and some really great neighborhoods too. It was a wonderful, wonderful place to stay. So. And we were close to Easter Claw. So this is the trolley that runs down the street. It's got a lot of shopping. We were, our neighborhood was about go. Oh, 10 minute walk from there. 10 minute 10 walk from there. It's the biggest pedestrian thoroughfare in, uh, in, in Istanbul. So we did that, but what's of note is in that video, you wouldn't have seen it uh, unless you look closely was my gym that I work out on. And also right by it, the location where the terrorist bomb went off several months ago. Now, clearly we but you know, that's a, uh, that just shows you that you're in town and you're you're part of where the other folks are. Yeah, we left the day the bomb went off. So, so it's the cool thing that we learned about Istanbul is it's for an Eastern Europe, Western Asia city, it's amazingly easy to get around with public transportation. So that's the trolley I talked about. Okay, they have ferries and they're like bus tickets, just take them right across the river. Because remember the city's on both sides. They have great trams, they have a great metro. And if you like bicycling, they have a lot of great bikeways, particularly along the Bosphorus. So there's lots of ways to get around in Istanbul. I mentioned biking. I love bicycling. That's a good way to, to get to see folks that are hiking. So we joined a bicycling club and these are some of us taking a break. You can put your bike on the metro. You can see some of these bike lanes here and there's the Bosphorus. And and if you're really uh, into climbing, you can get up in some of these mountains and look around. There's the Bosphorus. Uh, in the Istanbul. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the most wonderful things about Istanbul is the food. Oh my gosh. Um, fresh fish, if you like fish, it was incredible. I'd go down to the fish markets and buy the fish off the boats. That picture right there, Simi can tell you all about that. That was a restaurant that we actually went to with her. And that's a typical Turkish breakfast. And the breakfasts are served until 11 o'clock at night sometimes. And, and, and they just keep coming out with all that food. It's great. The next picture is our neighbor on top of the roof. She's cooking up there um, on, a, on a grill that her husband made for her. Um, Turkish delight, the fantastic produce that's there, just delicious produce. Uh, we love to eat there. <laughs> and we love to drink there. Um, <laughs> the wines, Turkish wines are really, really good, which was something that I really didn't know about before. Um, we learned about that and really enjoyed it. And um, actually that guy that's in the picture there, he's, uh, he's um, very talented. Mm -hmm who's looking to um, buy a vineyard in the Charlottesville area now and um, have dual vineyards. So I hope he does it because I'd love to have access to his wine all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wine so popular, even Rotary, in this case, Rotaract, we're selling it and we bought some bottles, part of a fundraiser. So. And cats and dogs. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Turk, um, Istanbul has over a million cats. Um, I guess you could call them strays, but they're not really, they're really community cats. They're community um, owned, um, community cared for. That's Allie down there in the corner, in the, the bottom who really cared for the cats in our neighborhood in Shahangar. Um, Most of them are get captured and vaccinated and they're so well fed that they're just the friendliest little things. They, every time you sit down, there's a cat that wants to be loved on, you know, so. Um, if you like cats, it's a nice uh, it's a nice place to go. There's there's also some dogs that are in the same boat, but not nearly as um, as common as the cats. And mm -hmm. the cats are pretty famous. There's a there's a documentary on YouTube about them. It's kind of fun. Yep, people buy these little houses and put them out on the street for them as well. And um, when you're in an area for three months, everybody tells you that you meet, oh my gosh, before you leave Turkey, you've got to see this, you've got to see that. So we use the last week whenever we're in an area to go see those things that everybody told us we got to see. 
And so we did take a week and we went to Troy and Gallipoli and then asked also to Cappadocia, which was fascinating. It was a really, really amazing last week to be there. Yep. That was the, our vacation. We take a vacation at the end of our nest. Right. <laughs> that throws some people off to quit some of my clients. Like, I, I thought you were already overseas. So, but yeah, we do try to dedicate some downtime where we can really go do some of the tourist activities outside of where we're nesting. Mm -hmm. So this gives you a little picture of what this lifestyle is like, kind of from a, a travel log point of view. Let me now shift and talk a little bit about Rotary and how it fits in with nesting abroad. And this is an experiment. I'm a relatively new Rotarian, joined in 2020, just when COVID happened, right? So I, unlike many of you that are deep in Rotary, it was kind of new. And we did it for two reasons. One, to get better plugged in to serve our own community. Remember, we wanted to keep touch with our own neighborhood, but also to accelerate and enrich our connections overseas. So let me use Istanbul again, since we talked about it as a travel log, um, as an example. So um, I'm a slow learner. I don't know if you caught that in the introductions, but here's my father-in-law in 2015, we mentioned earlier doing Rotary and I'm just trying to plug him into meetings because otherwise I'm stuck with my father-in-law in the apartment, right? <laughs> so it was my own self-interest. This I was had, when he visited us in New York. Yeah, I visited us in New York. So, so I'm thinking maybe Rotary is a good idea. Let me try to connect in Istanbul. So what did I do? Well, I do what you logically do, go check my Rotary Club Finder. And um, I found overseas, it really didn't work out so well. A lot of the clubs that were listed weren't open and people didn't respond when you send a message. So it didn't produce results. But I did go to Rotary Convention and network there and some of my friends from my club that were there. And that eventually led to us connecting with the past district governor for Istanbul area. There's Hassan and he hosted us for dinner soon after we arrived. That led to success. We plugged into many clubs, many events and activities. In fact, I counted them. 21 rotary activities that we participated in while we were there for the three months. There are some things that we did with rotary. So the hero, the George Washington of Turkey, okay, Ataturk, here's a picture of him. And this was the Victory Day celebration, August 30th, right, is when they celebrate the anniversary of a great victory in World War I in Gallipoli. Sue mentioned our trip to Gallipoli, so there's that history. Yep, and there's there's Big Al standing there, um, taking it all in, trying to have the same pose. Uh, close. <laughs> and great picnic with friends. There's the Rotary banners up. Okay, we had a chance to chat with the current district governor and some folks from other clubs in the district. Um, and a great party at night with rock singers. So that was like two days of jet lag and we were there and, and made some wonderful, met some wonderful folks. Yeah, we dove right in. This was another event we went to that was really quite interesting. This, this guy, Dink, he was an Armenian um, journalist who is a martyr. And um, we went to uh, an event to learn about him. Um, really fascinating. Um, but the other funny thing was they had arranged to go to dinner afterwards. And where did we go? To a place called Virginia Beef. And it wasn't. <laughs> it was not not what I'm used to eating in in Virginia. But it was that was just kind of funny. <laughs> so, so so two things I learned is that they really prize beef overseas a lot. They didn't bring they didn't go there because we were coming with them. This is where they wanted to go. There's a new restaurant opening, pretty hot. And the thing we've learned overseas, and maybe Australia's an exception, but we generally. Um, don't crave beef overseas because America does it so well in Canada as well. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the foods that U.S. just shines at. So, so across the Sea of Marmara was the Bursa Club. So we attended a meeting here. This is part of where they're talking about a prison project, and we learned that in Turkey, mothers with children keep their children in jail with them. That's that's where they're cared for by their mother up until school age, not just infancy, but all the way up through school age. So, and there's the president talking. This typical rotary meeting, right? What do you see in here? Yeah, you see someone checking their cell phone, right? A dinner <laughs> meeting, good wine. We mentioned the wine there. You can see some wine right up front. Um, but what's particular note is that some of the folks didn't speak English. So the president um, asked her daughter to come. There's her daughter. And we later joined her with the tour through the Asian side of Istanbul with her boyfriend. And connections to connections, her boyfriend had an aunt. And later when we did our 
our adventures for our vacation, we stayed at his aunt's place. So at tell him about that at, place. At Cappadocia, it was a um, it was a hotel that was in a cave. Um, so it was it was really great. It was a it was a really great find. So anyway. Go ahead. And one of the things we went to was a Greece themed party in honor of Olivia Newton John. Um, anybody who talks about how they wouldn't want to go to Turkey because it's so um, conservative, check out how the women are dressed. That, you know, that's, I, I think people underestimate how, how modern and, and uh, you know, how modern Turkey is. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's not all business meetings. It's a lot of fun as well. Uh -huh. So, and if I had restarted this with music, you actually would have heard music playing where the people were dancing around. So there's our banner exchange and there's the president of the club and the district governor. Okay. Um, is this you or me? This is me. I'll talk okay. about Ismet, another club in the area, another historic uh, city actually in the suburbs of Istanbul. And they talked about their scholarship program. They were very generous. They they hosted us for two days, put us up at a hotel. Um, this is one of the members doing a tour guide. Um, you know, you get to you get to actually spend time and meet. Like this is. Well, let's Sue talk about this. Oh, this is cool. I mean, it, because like you're with these business leaders in these cities that know people and things that you get to go to places and see things that you wouldn't have. He brought us into this mosque, this very um, ancient mosque. And actually um, that's a sword, a ceremonial sword that is used in the, in the, in the ceremonies in the mosque. And he let me hold it and, um, yeah. and pose with it, which um, I think was a kind of a really big deal. Um, something like he, like a, a normal tourist person, if we weren't nesting and we weren't making these rotary connections, never would have gotten to do it. Mm -hmm. So they had a, a scholarship and their scholarship to pay for a scholarship in Turkey is, is a lot less than it is in the United States. So as they went through it, we uh, offered to fund two of their students for a scholarship as part of the, the give back. So it's, it works both ways. Um, here's another example. We spent service project. Here they are. We're doing a service project with Rotaract. There's some islands uh, that are part of Istanbul, right? They're called Prince Islands because the, uh, the leaders used to put their second and third sons out there, the ones that weren't in line to, you know, weren't going to be the next to inherit the throne um, to kind of keep them out of the way. So they're doing an environmental project and working with them. They wanted to have a sister club in the United States. So I reached out to District 7600. And we worked it, and this just got signed here. The last signature was on the 7th of March. So set up between the College of William and Mary here in Virginia and Adelar, which is the islands of Istanbul. So with Rotaract, bicycled out there. There's that fundraiser that I mentioned as well. So worked with them on several activities. Here's some other things we did, some other club dinners. You see exchange in the banner. The district had a cruise up to Bosphorus. Some of the club leaders wanted to get together and just talk rotary issues. I had a chance to learn more about rotary issues. We went to Troy on that, that vacation. It turns out the tour guide and hotel folks were connected with rotary. So we ended up having a dinner together in Troy with them. Um, we did a concert in Istanbul that, that was rotary centric. And here's the past president of the club who helped connect us. That's the same one that was in that shopping with Sue earlier. So you know, we invited her to come to the concert with us. And Simi mentioned that we got together in Istanbul. You can see several of us here having, and this is a rest, this is the same restaurant that uh, Hassan introduced us to. And we liked it so much that when Simi came, we got a private room and, and brought her in there. So those are other engagements with Rotary that we could do while we were nesting. So I'll conclude this section with just my reflections on Rotary and nesting abroad. Okay, I think this really brings out this experiment in Istanbul because it's the first time we leveraged Rotary, the international aspect of RI. Many of you see it through ITHF, right? Many of you on this call are international. Um, you see it in other ways, but I thought it was a great case study. Um, you can give while you're there, and I'm not talking about just money, but you know, it, affordable scholarships, time and service projects, right? Uh, we helped them because most of the earthquake relief came through Istanbul. 
really to organize it. We talked about the Sister Rotaract Club and you know, we're exploring perhaps as we travel to do other connections, either Rotaract or Rotary for, for clubs, maybe even my own club in Fluvanna. And, uh, and to see if we can build bridges on Rotary friendship exchanges. It doesn't have to be just between like Sydney and District 7600. It maybe was something we could do through ITHF and help out the who's ever leading the RFE, Rotary Friendship Exchange for your district. Um, and we're getting better organized on club gift exchange. We bring some stuff from our local area. Now we're getting it branded as part of the Savannah Club to kind of build that bond between Virginia and wherever we visit. So, so if that's reflections on Rotary, let's close with some reflections on nesting abroad. On how we learned how to do this with nesting abroad. So why do we consider this lifestyle? It's kind of a sad story, but we came up with this idea to do this, driving home from my mom's funeral. Um, my mom died when she was 72. She had the same um, condition that Robin Williams had, um, which was very tragic. Um, and, but she was only 19 years old when I was born. So we started doing the math and realized that um, we had to stop talking about what we would do in the future and do it now um, to experience more of life, grow new relationships. But we didn't want to travel so much that we lost contact with our friends and our family at home. So that's why we did the three months on, three months off thing. Um, and the questions we asked ourselves when we were setting it up, do we want to make the necessary sacrifices? I mean, we sold our big house in Northern Virginia and moved to a much smaller place that was more affordable and easy to care for, easier to care for in Central Virginia. We had to restructure our work. Um, you have to see if, if you're going to be adaptable enough and have enough of a sense of humor and you like each other enough <laughs> to, <laughs> to travel like that. I mean, we joke that sometimes we get off the plane and I say, you're the only person I know on this continent right now. Um, so you've got to you've got to realize that, uh, you know, you've got to have a sense of humor and truly enjoy being with one another. And then uh, can we be away from our friends and family for so long? Um, two things are mitigating that. First of all, technology with the Zoom calls and things. But secondly, we find that a lot of people want to come visit us. It's like, you know, you've got an extra room in, in uh, Dubrovnik. Hey, I'm there. And that, that happens almost to the point of like somebody else is coming. So, <laughs> um, so what we've learned, um, this, this works for us. Um, I'm, I'm lost. Oh, oh, this works for us. We really enjoy living like this. And we do see even more of friends and family when they come to visit. It actually costs less than we expected because we're not eating out. Um, nearly as often, you know, like when you're traveling, you're eating all, out every meal. We cook at home. We shop at home. When we do go out, you know, where the neighborhood restaurants are, the locals eat at. Right. We're not eating at the tourist places with 14 different languages on the menu, you know. Um, and um, also a lot of the places that we go to um, are less expensive, much less expensive at times than, um, than the United States. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're, we're living on the economy. We're living like uh, normal people. So it's it's not doing the things that cost and, a ton of money. And compared to even 10 years ago, the technology has changed. We've all seen it from COVID now. We're familiar with Zoom. We're on Zoom now. So the working abroad has gotten a lot easier. And more importantly, at least in my realm, more accepted by those we work with. They don't think you're out vacationing for three months. They can understand that you're working remotely. But just as importantly is, is technology for living abroad, right? Right. I mean, Google Maps, a Google Translate, that was especially important in Taiwan. Um, so it's 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 become a lot easier with all the technology to do this. Yeah. So apps that will actually route you on mass transit and tell you arrival times for the next bus, uh, you know, and warn you when they're coming. Translate where you can actually take the picture and look at it and it changes the menu from the foreign language into English. Or if you want to talk to the doorman, you put auto translate, put it in the middle and it's kind of like Star Trek Universal Translator. You just talk in English and it, and it comes out in Romanian and then the guy talks in Romanian and it comes back out in English. You know, and they're just so happy to chat and learn. 
So those speed bumps, none of those were impossible, but the tech really has made it easier to live there without feeling you need a full-time tour guide or a tour bus. So, so this lifestyle, just to kind of compare and contrast, it sounds like, it sounds like I'm Professor Mink when I say that, but here's a traditional lifestyle, life cycle. Okay, and I'm looking to see who's on it. I, I see that there's a Norma and Peter both here from Ontario. So you're just in the middle of my screen, I just picked you. Um, is this your pattern of life? Did you, when you're young, you went to school, um, then you started work, met each other, started growing a family. I don't know. I, I'm just picking on you. I don't even know if you're a couple. And then uh, <laughs> add or yes, planning yeah. on retirement. So uh, it wasn't exactly like that. A little more complicated, but I get the point completely. Yeah. <laughs> Majority of the time, yeah, that's what we did. Mm -hmm. So when we embarked on this, we were about here. Thank you for sharing that, by the way, both of you. So we were about here, you know, three quarters of the way through this green thing, looking forward to the retirement when we were driving back from Sue's mom's funeral. And this is when we thought we didn't want to wait till we got to the end of the green to start the golden years, that we should try to start mixing it up because maybe it's too late. Okay. So, so let's compare that. There's another group that figured this out before us. And these are, the, these are I say, young kids. Um, these are the digital nomads and expats, right? They'll young, they'll be 20, 23 years old out of college and they'll just go over, overseas. They'll work for an American company or their home country. It could be Canadian or any other country, Indian, anything. Um, and then after they've done that for several years, they've partied, they've met people, they've seen the world, they'll settle down usually back in their home country and do this work vacation plan until they get to retirement. Okay. And nesting abroad, it's kind of taking the digital nomad, but flipping it. So we take the advantage of this green box that we've already grown a family, that we've, we have knowledge and expertise that we can use for teaching, consulting, whatever it is that we do. And we do it while we're overseas nesting abroad. And instead of waiting for retirement to go from zero to 100, like a step function, um, what we would think about in retirement, work ramps down and non-work ramps up. Okay, so that's nesting abroad. So some things that we learned on this from this is that shoulder seasons are the best. That's spring and fall. We can talk a lot about why that's so much better than going to vacation in the summer or the winter. Uh, part of that shoulder season, one of the benefits is that you can get great rates and we negotiate for even better rental rates. And little things like what size apartment? You know, one bedroom, a suite, a loft. We found a, a full two bedroom is right so that we have an office when no one's visiting and we have a place for folks to visit when they come. So Sue. Okay. Um, we, we learned that there's a, like a lot of ways to get cultural experience. When we took, um, when we were in Panama, we took Spanish lessons because there was, we, we got kind of tired of going to the beach every day. Um, <laughs> we learned about blocking time at the beginning or even better at the end of our nests for a short vacation. To, to go to all the places everybody told us we should go. We learned how to live on one suitcase and a carry-on for three months. It's very possible, you can do it. And in fact, I've, I'm packed pretty much for Sydney at this point and even half of my suitcase is full of gifts and things to bring. So I've really only got a, a carry-on and a half a suitcase of stuff. Um, we learned how to better connect with new friends and colleagues. These are folks that we met in Krakow who were um, alumni of, our, of, of CMU where we both attended. We became very good friends with them. Then they moved to Bucharest. We went to Bucharest. Now they live in uh, Dallas. We went to visit them in Dallas. They can't get rid of us. Um, so, you know, we, we have just, we have made contacts. Well, Paul, who wrote across the country with us, we've made contacts with people all over the world that we're close friends with at this point. Um, we've learned to research, especially if you're going to be in a larger city, um, learn to research the location um, so that we, you know, you're in a place that um, is where real, real people live. You're not in the uh, tourist areas, but you're also close enough. Um, to that and you're in an area that you feel comfortable in. We learned about discounts and opportunities offered to locals. You have an address. So you can go 
with your address and you can register for things. In Barcelona, if you have a library card, um, which you can get with an address, you can get into all kinds of things for free. Um, it's, it's great. So um, to, to research those discounts and things that are offered to locals because you're there long enough to count mm -hmm. as a local. And, and access to things that tourists aren't allowed even into. So what would you say is important if uh, selecting a neighborhood that people live in? What are some of the indicators of that? Okay, well, um, one of the things that we look for is we look for an area that has grocery stores and schools, because that's where real people live, right? <laughs> um, there aren't really grocery stores and schools in the really high um, tourist areas. Uh, that's one of the one of the primary things we look for. Okay, I'll keep going on this here. Oh, another thing we learned: um, we're going to do. We only have so far gone to uh, Taipei, but we're going to do more in Asia. We really, really enjoy doing Asia, and with Google Translate, it's a whole lot easier. That woman in that there, she's teaching us how to make dumplings. Our um, landlord in, uh, in Taipei introduced us to her and we went over and spent the day making dumplings with her. She could not speak a word of English. All we could say is please and thank you in Chinese, but um, with Google Translate, it worked. Mm -hmm. so, Credit to her, the dumplings came out pretty well. Yeah. Another thing we learned um, is that um, one of the places we went was Dubrovnik and Dubrovnik is a wonderful place for a couple of days, but we learned that we really, uh, the, the whole region really was um, the area that we wanted to learn about. So, uh, so some places that people tell you, oh, you need to go there. It's not the best place for nesting. Um, you, you need to learn a little bit about it. And then also to really, really be aware of the cruise ship and tour schedules, because some places like Barcelona, uh, like um, Barcelona and Dubrovnik can be just overwhelmed when the cruise ships dock. So you, you learn how to schedule your life around the cruise ships like, uh, like the people that live there do. Mm -hmm. We learned that from the folks that live there. There's websites actually that they track and alerts. So, and, and I think what Sue is saying is this teases out the difference between a vacation and a nest. And Dubrovnik is a good example. It was a rich experience, but it's probably better suited for a vacation than a nest. Okay. So, We've tried to capture some of this that we've learned into a blog, a website. It's nestingabroad.com. I know it's not very original, um, but that's where we're at. Uh, we can post it in the chat too. And the only reason I, I put that out there is we're looking for feedback. And if you have questions, it's a good place to go as, as well as to Sue and me. Because again, we're, we're really interested in growing the community, not to monetize it, but just so just like ITHF, in warm beds that we can help each other and share insights and grow our, our body of knowledge. Warm showers. Warm showers, right? <laughs> warm beds. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so as a bicycle that's, thing, that's warm a showers. <laughs> so, so that's out there. So let me move this to Q&A because um, we're right at the time for that. So in closing, I said, we really, our goal is to inspire others to try nesting abroad. So we're, we're doing it for about, three months, two and a half, three months at a shot, you know, it could be experimented to do it at a month, right? Perhaps some folks, that's what they want to do. Uh, so we can collaborate with other nesters, local rotary clubs to share tips and experiences, use leverage rotary to get the word out. Um, maybe even have a discussion about this, uh, uh, Simi and Madhu at, uh, at, at Melbourne. And then uh, yeah, with rotary, just continue to explore the synergy. I mentioned RFE. Um, for this next year, I'm going to be the chair for our district, for our international, the International Service Committee, and I'm on the global grants. So Colleen was on there last night. She was on there with me. So, you know, how do you connect, given that you're nesting overseas and you're part of Rotary, you know, how do you act as leverage? How do you help with sister clubs? So we're trying to think through, like, if you're going to be there and connect with Rotary, what can you do to help the Rotarians back in, at your home district, as well as those you're visiting? just by being there through connecting and thinking, put some discipline and structure on that. So that's what we hope to do. That's us in closing, Al Sue, Nesting Abroad. So open to questions, comments. Thank you so much for this presentation. You did a great job and uh, Al and Sue. I, I'm 
Alicia, we saw Orvin back and I will be moderating the question and answer. I did pay attention to who was um, putting questions on the chat. If, uh, if, if therefore, I am going to start with those to make sure that we answer their questions before we do much. And I, I know that everybody is busy and everything. So I think around five minutes after, uh, around 11 o'clock, I will close the Q&A and I'll let Simi give us the, the closing remarks. And then if I think, Madhu, is it okay if people want to stay a little bit longer if they want to ask questions? Okay, that way, because I know not everybody may want to stay until the very end, but let's start. I'm going to start with uh, some of the questions and I will uh, read the question and uh, if I, uh, and uh, the ones that came on chat. So as I said, so that we can, uh, we don't have to stay. I'm trying to get to get my, um, my view, but let's start with the first one. The first one was from Linda Tyler, and it says, did you take your own bike and equipment, Al? I do take my own bike. In fact, I just looked to see if I could have a quick picture of it. I pack it up into a case that's about the size of a suitcase. It conforms to airlines, so they don't charge me extra for an oversized piece of baggage. And then it's not just a bicycle. Anyone who cycles knows that. You have to have the helmet and the shoes and everything else. So I'm at more than I'm at one luggage for my bike and part of another luggage for my gear, for my equipment. And then the rest of the luggage is for my own personal clothes. The so. bike comes apart. Mm -hmm. is, is it, it comes, yeah. It's, you got to take it apart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we yeah, bring, I used, I used I to have a bike great. shop, so I'm familiar with breaking them down and building them back. Mm -hmm. Well, that's super. I, if you're going to nest, I so encourage you that you know, you're a cyclist. It is a huge win. It's a way to engage in the community. It's a way to see things that you can't see even with the car or hiking, right? It's just really powerful. And then sometimes I find things and then I bring you to them. Yep, right? yep, he does. See, we don't have a car when we nest. So um, he, yeah, he goes out and explores and, and finds things. So, so we compensated for Dubrovnik by me bicycling in one day from Croatia to Montenegro, to Bosnia, Herzegovina, and back, big triangle, and border crossings all along the way. That was a really powerful ride. Okay, I know we only have like eight minutes, so. Yes, the second question is from Mustafa and from Andy. How do you find rentals, apartments? Uh, there's different ways we find them, um, word of mouth, but honestly, probably the most common way is through like Airbnb and v VRBO. And, and sites like that. Um, and the important thing is to try to find a place that's not right in the tourist area. It, I, we try to find a place that's where, you know, we call them real people. <laughs> it's not like tourists aren't real, but you know, <laughs> where, where the, the residents live. So we can live a, a lifestyle like they do. Okay, um, John Henderson, do you want to ask your question or should I continue just asking the questions? Okay, John wants to know if you try to learn the language where, where you nest. As much as possible. I mean, we're there for three months. So um, um, we know, we both know a little bit of German. I'm trying to learn Spanish, but um, we do work on learning the simple phrases like very important is thank you and and please and excuse me and um where's the bathroom <laughs> um <laughs> and check please and then we also always wind up by the time we're gone learning um a lot of, that's on the menu but um that's that's realistically if you're going to go to two different places in the world every year you can't learn every language, but we, we work on it on the basics as much as possible. Okay. Mark, Max uh, Copenhagen, Copenhagen, you want to ask your question? You want me to ask it for you? So. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak up. Um, I've, I've been on GSE team in Thailand and I've, I've done two homestays in Australia and England uh, with, with uh, the ITHF group. I, I'm I'm trying to understand where this fits in in the in the rotary structure and um, 
also I'm interested in, in the vocational training teams and trying to get something like that going in our district. So um, I think it's, it's more of a structural question. Um, and then also three months seems like a long time to be in some place that, you know, I would need some structure. <laughs> I think the question is here is, is this a nesting related to vocational training, rotary vocational training? So on that, Max, I really don't know much about rotary vocational training. And remember one of the three objectives of, of working with rotary is to see how else while we're traveling or living this lifestyle that we could plug in to rotary. So this sounds like something we should check out. Are, are you really engaged in it? Well, uh, what's called vocational training teams evolved out of the um, group study exchanges uh, and they're funded by global grants. So it's a, it's a means if you take half a dozen people of, a, of one profession, go to another country and teach them something. And so oh, it yeah. lasts a few weeks. So it, it is different, but um, what you're doing sounds great too. Well, we might, perhaps we could do some of this to explore opportunities for the vocational training, for example, or participate in one that's nearby. So um, I'm going to put that on my list of things to add to, like sister clubs, RFE, right? Um, I'm already thinking global grants, but I had never thought about the vocational training part of a global grant. So thank you for making me aware of that. So that's one way in. And I'm really interested in some of those like you who know Rotary well, of how we can plug in this lifestyle for, for Rotary, not just for us, but anybody else that wants to do it, where it would fit. I don't see it being like, at least in the near term, a formal part of Rotary, but rather just something some Rotarians do, they, they can integrate Rotary with it in a new way. Thank you. Uh, David and Cheryl, Cheryl Dittweiler, you are there. Do you want to ask your question or do you want me to ask it? Are they here? Are they still here or did they? Uh, well, it's good for everybody anyway. Would David and Cheryl ask what, what type of phone of service do you use when you're, ab when you're abroad? I was going to write it. But... Say again? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. What, what type of phone service yeah. do you use? So we've worked, we're here where we started is we were, we were on one of the local traditional carriers in America, right? Uh, Verizon, 